Welcome to our cyber church. I'm Karen Love Basinger, the pastor at Florence United Methodist Church on the windswept sand dunes of the beautiful and wild Oregon coast. My husband, Alan, is here sharing with me in our call to worship this morning. If you remember the good old days back in the sanctuary, uh, we would do this responsibly, this reading. So here, our call to worship, our call to hope. There is something deeper than trouble. It, it is, is mercy. mercy. God's amazing grace. Carrying, Carrying lifting, lifting, holding us, us in all seasons. seasons. There is something more powerful than despair. It, it is mercy. mercy. God's, God's amazing, amazing love. love. Seeing us through dark nights, waves of sadness, mountains of grief. There is something longer lasting than pain. It, it is mercy. God's healing touch. Bringing us hope, leading us to joy, teaching us to sing. Let us pray our words of invocation. Great healer, make us aware of your spirit of holiness, wholeness, here in our homes as we worship virtually online. Touch all our channels of communication right now. Bind us together across time and space, even as we are physically distant from one another. Touch and heal our brokenness and lift us out of despair and doubt. Dry our tears of pain and sorrow. Comfort and nourish us with the many blessings of your great love, O oh God. May we flourish and blossom in the warmth and compassion of your healing love and grace. Help this be a time of blessing for us all. Amen. Hi, everyone. I'm greeting you here from my backyard. And I just want to say that I hope you're all doing well and are safe and healthy. Um, I do, of course, miss seeing you all and can't wait for the time again when we'll be able to be together and give each other hugs <laughs> and um, commune together. So God bless you all and take care. Hello, everybody. Greetings from the Cindy Beauty Boutique, a.k.a. our garage. This is Cindy and Peggy Hughes. And I'm going to try not to get her ear this time. <laughs> yeah, as you almost get my eye. <laughs> anyway, we are at it again. And we hope that you are busy doing things that are unexpected, too. This time has definitely been a challenge, but, you know, we're all up to the task. And we're all going to make through, make it through, I think, just fine. So we miss seeing everybody, and we want to say hi to you at this time and hope that everything in your life is going well. May blessings abound. Bye.
since the first reported death from COVID-19. And it's the two-month anniversary of George Floyd's funeral. During our prayer time now, in face of the recent tragedy in Beirut, we pray for all those who were killed in this horrific explosion in its aftermath, for those who've died from racial injustice and murder, for those whose lives have been lost in the face of this COVID-19 pandemic, and for all our personal losses, we hold space. After we watch a one-minute video of a grandmother in Beirut, this video was taken by her granddaughter. It's on ABC News. Please pray silently, and we will close our prayer time, as usual, with Amanda Sorrell leading us in singing the Lord's Prayer. Funny tonight, amid the devastation, the grandmother being seen by the world. Tonight, with so many families in Beirut, really from that massive explosion, without a place to live now, this image being shared across that city and the world. A grandmother, Maya Boot Melky, playing piano inside her devastated home today, sitting there in the corner, her blown out living room, playing old Lane's eye. That's her family sifted through what is left. Her granddaughter posting the video with the caption, Beauty from Ashes. Tonight, one grandmother, her music, a sign of hope and resilience amid the devastation.
must forgive as we have been forgiven. In the time of trial, lead us into light. For yours is the kingdom. The scripture today is found in Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat battered by waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God.
when we last met for worship together in our sanctuary at the end of February. But it will be the last time, the long time. The following weekend from when we last met, the first weekend of March, we were gathered with the Presbyterians and the Lutherans and the Episcopalians and the Catholics in our community. And with our annual ecumenical spiritual retreat weekend, we worshiped at the Presbyterian Church. So we were in our church. By the following weekend, due to the growing number of COVID cases, our bishop was suspended in person worship and closed the church building in all her Episcopal area of the Greater Northwest, Oregon, Idaho, Washington, and Alaska. Now certainly, nobody planned for this. This is not my plan. As one post I saw on Facebook recently said, the most useless thing purchased so far in 2020 was their 2020 planner. Larry Kreider in his book, Bottom Line Faith, writes, like the label on the back of salad dressing, shake well before using, shaking and usefulness are twin, are twin brothers. God doesn't forewarn. He doesn't explain. He just shakes. God shook Job, and he lost everything. God shook Jonah, and the bottom dropped out of his plans, and he ended up in the belly of the whale. God shook the apostles. The vibrations didn't stop till they reached heaven. An unshaken bottle creates a sour sediment like that at the bottom of a wine vat. This was a picture from a picture of Moab in Jeremiah 48:11. Moab had been at rest from youth, like wine left on its dregs not poured from one jar to another. She has not gone into exile. She tastes as she did, and her aroma is unchanged. Now the nation of Moab had become stale and flat and sour because she was sedimentary, calcified, hardened. God restores nations and people by shaking them up. When this shaking, where this shaking leads is known only to God. So shaking, then, is a sign of God's involvement in our lives. If things weren't a bit turbulent, we may wonder if God's ignoring us. God doesn't just shake for the sake of, sake of shaking. There's a reason. The stuff of life is being rearranged and people are going to be affected. Now, Larry Kreider wrote this in 1995. So in our reading for today, the disciples' lives had already been turned upside down and shaken. They had left everything to follow Jesus, and now here they were in a boat being driven further and further from shore. Battered by the waves, they were terrified of capsizing and drowning in this horrible storm that had come up. They were so scared they were not even able to recognize Jesus when they saw him walking towards them on the water. They cried out, It's a ghost! Really, I mean, how many times have you seen somebody walking on water? And extreme anxiety and fear and absolute terror for your life causes the body to literally distort your senses as we process a threat to our existence. But immediately Jesus said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Do you realize that do not be afraid or fear not is the most common encouragement and counsel that we find in the Bible? Now, Peter wanted to test the spirits. Now, was this really Jesus, as he said he was, or was it a ghost, as their eyes were thinking you know, they saw? Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water, Jesus said to him. And Jesus said to him, come. So Peter got out of the boat. He starts walking on the water toward Jesus. But when his mind slipped out of Christ consciousness, and focus. And when he went back into the phys physical reality consciousness and he took his eyes off of Jesus and he saw the strong winds around him again, he went back into his terrified state of consciousness and he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out to him with his hand and caught him and asked him, you have little faith, why did you doubt? So they walked across the water together back to the boat. They got back in the boat and the wind Ceased. And those in the boat, the Bible says, worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, Peter was uplifted. He was saved by love. When Peter was able to turn his eyes upon Jesus, as our hymn says, when he was able to stay focused on love, he was delivered from fear, the paralyzing terror that was causing him to sink into the waters that would have surely drowned him. 
And this past month, past month, I've been talking about hope. What can we hope in? What's the source of our hope in these days we live in? In the first two weeks of this focus on hope, one thing I didn't go into when I was preaching on Paul's magnificent, soaring, elevated passages from Romans was that in these passages, Paul speaks of sin as more of a principality and a power, more of a force of evil more than merely our individual moral failings on a personal level. That's why I've been talking to you about systemic sin, forces of sin. Uh, you may not personally be a racist in terms of your conscious awareness and your practice, but we participate in a systemic evil and we allow that to happen. So right now, as a planet, we're in this huge storm at sea. We're called as disciples of Jesus Christ to walk on the water, to step out into the waters, into what feels like certain death if we go based purely on our own resources and powers and the selves that we know ourselves to be. We know we can't walk on water of ourselves. We're being battered by huge waves and terrible winds of chaos and disruption and collapse. And where is our hope in this overwhelming situation where daily, you know, when we go online, if we go online, if we read the newspaper, we boom scroll. We just keep, you know, reading more and more in our news feed and almost all the news is bad these days. I'm reading a book by a Franciscan priest, Richard Rohr, Contemplative and Mystic, Contemplative and Contemplative. It's titled The Wisdom Way, Order, Disorder, and Reorder. Father Will points out what the, that the mystics saw that universal pattern, order, disorder, reorder, in life around them and in their own interior journeys. About six months ago, we had relative order in our lives. Now we're in the disorder stage. We're out on the water being tossed by huge battering waves, and we have to keep our eyes upon Jesus to get through this. We have to keep our eyes upon him so that we can be part of the reordering of life that will follow this disorder. You know, when, and we have to keep our eyes on him to stay aligned with the values and the priorities of God's kingdom. Normal, you know, normal, the order we were living in was not working for so many people, especially people of color, people in poverty, even, you know, the besieged middle class. Friday, the uh, lay leadership nominating team had a meeting by Zoom to look at our current leadership needs and start getting ready for our fall church conference. And I, frankly, I had a come to Jesus moment during our meeting on awareness. You know, as we process the state of our congregation in this time of extraordinary stress, and really right now at this stage of our disorder uh, in our world, we are blessed by all external measures. I mean, we have enough of what we need. In this moment, we're safe, we're okay, but we are stressed. You know, it's that inner uh, turmoil that many of us are feeling. You know, we're confined to our homes, to shelter in place. It's been going on for so long. We're not physically distant from, from almost all those relationships and activities that brought so much meaning and nurture and joy to our lives. Most of our congregation is in the high risk, really, of the severe complications as we contracted COVID-19. So we have to stay home to stay safe and wear masks and physically you know, social distance if we go out. It's stressful watching more or less from afar as our families and our friends struggle with the impact, you know, one impact of this pandemic after another. Our school systems are shaken. Our nation, our economy, all in some degree of disorder or distress. Much less the impact of just living through a global pandemic. Our health is being affected by all the stress. You can see it in the prayer chain request. Where is our hope in all this? Two years ago, I attended a conference in Portland that I've talked about before. It was on transformational, what's called transformational resilience, uh, where, you know, if something happens and you adapt to it, you know, you, uh, you reel from the impact of it, but you live through it and get through it, hopefully. And then if it's transformational resilience, you don't just come out at the same level you were at. You don't just return to normal. Through transformational resilience, you're changed, you're transformed by the trauma, and you are actually stronger and better shape. 
So uh, this was put on for agencies and groups, including faith-based communities in the Northwest, to help them get prepared, to help our population in the Northwest to be prepared for the challenges of climate disruption. We need to understand that 30% of our population is living with untreated trauma, and the stressors that are coming will just make that trauma load heavier. So we were told to be prepared for more, uh, you know, higher rates of mental unwellness, uh, suicide rates, illness, and all that. So what we have to do as a church is to increase and strengthen our resilience. Uh, you know, first we have to put on our own oxygen mask and then do what we can as we are able and have the capacity to, to reach out to others who are feeling overwhelmed by the storm that we're in. Overwhelm is a key concept in all this. You know, we're uh, humans in the animal kingdom. We have animal bodies, and our nervous systems have to be calmed down and soothed. We're not, we have not only our own stressors individually, but when we read the news, as Christians, as people with hearts, with empathy, we get stressed learning of the suffering of others. So the main thing I want to encourage you to do this week is do all you can to keep your eyes on Jesus. And your nervous system, for various reasons, may be so overwhelmed with all that's going on personally or globally that you're too anxious to even be able to recognize Jesus when you see him, kind of like Peter. So to calm our bodies down enough to even pray, to connect with Jesus, to get us out of our, you know, we have to get out of our thinking minds. Uh, it's like they say in the 12-step movement, it's, uh, it's always our thinking is our best thoughts that got us here. So get out of our thinking minds, which are not able to feel the emotions. They're just, you know, doing their own trip. So I encourage you, because of the beauty of where we live here on the Oregon coast, to do two things this week, if at all possible, and then connect with Jesus. So maybe you're homebound right now and you won't be able to get out. In that case, I encourage you to try to find photos or images or videos or whatever of what I'm going to be asking you to experiment with this week. Now, first, because we live on the coast, and some of you live on, you know, on the lake or by the river, I want to ask you to consider taking advantage of all the healing possible through our relationship with water. came across an article recently that said, even daydreaming about traveling to a faraway, traveling off to a faraway island where the sand is warm and the water's crystal blue can give people a sense of calm. So this should make it no surprise that actually sitting next to a body of water actually does some pretty fantastic, has some pretty fantastic well-being benefits. According to best-selling author and marine biologist Wallace Day Nichols, merely being close to a body of water, be it a sea, a river, a lake, or an ocean, promotes mental health and happiness. And he wrote about it in his book, Blue Mind, Blue Mind. The term blue mind describes the mildly meditated state that we fall into when we're near, in, or on or under the water, he told uh, USA Today in 2017. It's the antidote to what we refer to as the red mind, uh, which is frankly what a lot of us are pretty caught up in right now. The red mind is the over-anxious, over-connected, over-stimulated state that defines the new normal of modern life. He said that three years ago. Now, as Nichols noted, research proves his theory that being near water can help us all achieve an elevated and sustained happiness. That elevated level of happiness occurs because, according to Nichols, water helps in lowering stress and anxiety, increasing an overall sense of well-being and happiness. It lowers your heart rate and breathing rate, and uh, you have safe, better workouts. Aquatic therapists are increasingly looking to the water to help treat and manage PTSD, addiction, anxiety disorders, autism, and more. So maybe that's why people are we're all, you know, willing to pay more for a house along the water or a room or an ocean view. Moreover, when we're near water, it increases our creativity. It helps our conversational abilities. But, you know, being near water doesn't only help us in our waking hours. It helps us in our sleep, too. Uh, w. Christopher Winter, M.D., author of The Sleep Solution, says there's some research that says people may sleep better when they're adjacent to nature. No wonder sleep machines always speak of the sound of rain, the ocean, or a flowing river. So in your homework this week, uh, your spiritual discipline practice is to spend time watching the water, 
however you can. Now the second suggestion I have for you to help you feel more balanced and hopeful is to spend time with trees in the woods or at least looking at pictures or images or videos of trees and forests that you can't get out. So picture yourself immersed deep in the woods or actually be immersed deep in the woods in some of the wonderful uh, forests that we have around here. Now if you can imagine the canopy bathed in sunlight, brimming with beauty and the leaves glistening in the sun. The Japanese have a distinct untranslatable word for this, komoribu. The ground lush with mosses and ferns, is stirring with the sounds of unseen creatures and critters underfoot. So it's, it's no wonder that a walk out in nature leaves us all feeling happier and healthier. That's our natural habitat after all. But did you know that something as simple as a walk in the woods can help relieve stress, strengthen the immune system, and even prevent certain diseases? I think there's a, a link to cancer prevention through walking in the woods. It's the ancient practice of forest bathing, which amounts to a meditative walk in the forest as a way to promote well-being. In Japan, where they have vast forests that make up 67% of the landscape, the government's emphasizing these forests you know, as a way to try to relax their stressed population, overworked and stressed. So uh, they, they, over the past 10 years, they've established 48 forest therapy trails, and they've put more than 4 million into these programs. And so they're, 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 the scientists are heralding forest bathing as a kind of natural aromatherapy with quantifiable effects. Now, one of the advocates of forest bathing is Tim Lee, MD, PhD, associate, associate professor at Tokyo's uh, Nippon Medical School, and the Vice President, Secretary General of the International Society of Nature and Forest Medicine, Nature and Forest Medicine, based in Japan, one of the leading, world's leading researchers on forest medicine. And he says it was the practice was first inspired by the ancient spiritual practice of Shinrin Yoku, translated literally into forest bathing. So according to him, the idea is to let nature enter your body through all your senses, the fragrance of the forest the green colors of the plants, the murmuring of streams and the singing of birds, the eating of forest foods and the touching of trees. Yeah, hug a tree. So this kind of living in the present allows you to feel alive, aware, and energized. And, uh, you know, it's even preventive medicine in Japan. Uh, they, they think that your they have found through research that your natural killer cell levels, natural killer cell levels for your immune system are significantly higher after a day of forced bathing compared to a normal day of stress. So, translation. Well, um, you know, as I said, it, the research shows it helps prevent cancer and other science-based studies link forced bathing to reduce stress, lower immunity, lower blood pressure, and improve overall physical and mental health. Now, that's meditative magic for you. So anybody can force bathe, says Lee, just sit in the house and never get yourself to just rest in a quiet, sunny spot and just take it easy. So, you know, unwind in the natural elements. And you could, if, you, if you're kind of homebound, you could uh, do something at home like uh, have a terrarium or plants or you know, find ways to have inspirational leaf plants or whatever. Presbyterian Minister Byron Bangert wrote, Do not be afraid means more than rest easy. It implies something like, take heart, have courage, be open and willing to receive what's coming. Get ready for the new things God's about to do in your life. It's an invitation to welcome rather than retreat uh, from the new future that goes with it. Um, it's not always easy. It's easier to stick with the tried and familiar, he says. Easier to complain than to try new remedies. Easier to live with known disappointments than to venture into unknown possibilities. It's easier even to keep fighting the battles that we know than to take on a whole different approach to living. So three different spiritual practices for you this week to calm your nervous system. First, watch the water. Hang out with the water. Second, bathe in the forest. At least take a yard and walk around your yard if you, if you can't get to the forest. And third, do all you can through prayer, meditation, hanging out with Jesus in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or through singing, or through holy conversation and Christian conferencing, through reading inspirational books, be uplifted by love. Be uplifted by the Christ. He offers you his hand, and he asks you to come with him. 
with his help and his faith and his love, you can walk on these waters. Amen.
He's so delighted that he's been able to share this sacred time with us. Um, after I've spoken benediction that I'm about to give, we will have a beautiful time with us. Video benediction, so um, receive this spoken benediction. Holy Spirit, so infill our souls with the power to emulate the very breath of Jesus Christ that all who cross our path in life would say they saw his face in us. Let us go forth as people enmeshed in the living, breathing presence of Jesus Christ, hands outstretched to all who cross our path in need. Out of the pale darkness he rises up into the light. Bright rays of sun split the top of trees. The clouds depart. The blues go the sky. The smell of angels blended is near. The air feels a cool breeze. This is not the garden. But a new world made from the eruption of hope in a life that cannot be held down. We were witnesses to the life that rose from the dead. God's relentless love comes close to us, moving stones from tombs, opening the heart to a new possibility. Death no longer stands.